Hi, I'm Chris Cabrera, Associate Principal Timpani of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, and we're back uh, for another installment of the live stream education series. And today we're talking about snare drum etudes. I'm going to show you guys um, how a percussionist would take some snare drum etudes and practice these on a drum pad at home. So we'll start off with the easier etudes. Uh, there's supposed to be four etudes today. Uh, two concert styled etudes and then two rudimental style etudes. Um, two at a, at a much uh, easier level and then two at a harder level. So we'll start with the intermediate uh, snare drum studies by Mitchell Peters. And the one I said I was going to do is etude number three. We'll talk about some of the musical aspects on this. We'll talk about things like uh, tempo, sticking, dynamics, phrasing. Etude number three, really basic, not a lot of uh, rudiments or rolls or anything like that. Mostly straight rhythm, uh, incorporating dynamics, different dynamic changes, um, and the same meter, no meter changes on this either. I wanted to start with something uh, very basic and just very straightforward. And with that, talk about how you can phrase some of these ryth uh, rhythmic uh, groupings because hopefully it didn't just all sound monotone. The phrases are pretty simple. Most of these are, you can think of them as four bar phrases or eight bar phrases. And hopefully you can hear the difference in the lilt and the difference in, you know, some of the phrasing and articulation. You know, all of these things that our other colleagues in the orchestra, instrumentalists do, uh, we can do as well on snare drum and you can even do it and practice it on a drum pad. You have to approach all this stuff from a musical stance. If you try to just come at it and you just try to play along with the metronome the click and you just try to do right hand lead sticking for everything uh, and you try to get it just really clean, that's not good enough. You really want to think about how other instrumentalists would phrase some of these things and, and try to um, accentuate certain things more than others. Um, so let, let's, let's take the, we'll take the opening phrase. We'll take the opening, what is that, seven, one, two, three, four, five, the first eight bar phrase. I'll play this again. And then I'll also play it on, and show you how to, how you can practice this on timpani too, even if you just have a timpani pad at home. Because uh, the chops are a little bit different. If you, have, you, you know, everybody kind of has a slightly different uh, grip for timpani as opposed to snare drum. So it's something you want to work on and try to translate translate those two things. So uh, the opening phrase Can you hear the difference, the slight difference in all of those as opposed to you know something that's more Hopefully 
the first example, as opposed to the second one, translates a little bit more. But what I am trying to convey in that first example is a little bit more musicality, a little bit more lilt to the phrasing, a little bit more, I'm even playing a little bit with, with those rests. I'm not being extremely strict with that. I'm trying to show, you know, uh, the anticipation of certain things and then the resolution rhythmically. Um, trying to get to the, especially during things like I'm resolving to big beat two or if you're subdividing as eighth notes, beat four in that last measure. Right, trying to resolve to that, trying to show more anticipation within those, you know, within those rests to resolve once you get back to the downbeat. So let me play some of this on the timpani pad too. Kind of show you what that what that looks like here. no flams or ornaments or anything like that, rudiments. You can do all this stuff uh, on, on a timpani pad with timpani mallets. Um, and I would also even suggest some of the, you know, when I when I move to some of the more difficult concert etudes or even, even rudimental stuff, you can work on some of that stuff on, on the drum pad with the timpani mallets too. It's, it's not a bad thing. Even trying to figure out how to play some of the Delacluse etudes, uh, you know, trying to play Delacluse 1 uh, with with, with timpani mallets on a, on a timpani pad, figuring out how to do some of those ornaments, uh, you can definitely translate it and you can try to, you can try to make that work. Uh, and, it, and it gives your hands a workout and you're also still practicing something musically. You know, once you get a sticking configuration down, I kind of do a hybrid thing. I don't play everything right hand lead. Sometimes I'll, especially for the, eight, uh, for the eighth notes, I switched to some alternating just to give some relief to that right hand, and it also helps with with lilting, especially when I do it on timpani. I, I alternate more so any chance I can get. You know, I might even play the beginning of something like if I'm playing on timpani. alternate off the right and off the left on both on all those rhythmic figures on snare drum in the orchestra I wouldn't do that I'd probably play right hand lead for everything just because you want the clarity on timpani though uh, you actually lose clarity when you when you're playing a lot of right hand lead you know if you if you keep beating in the same spot what you're doing is you start to cancel out your sound so the more you have a right hand lead and a right especially right hand heavy if you're right handed uh, it's it's actually worse for the sound and for the clarity of the rhythm and you also you won't be able to shape phrases as well snare drum it's different so let's move on and let's go to the rudimental solo for this week this is the Charlie Wilcoxon rudimental solo and again with that with that last solo what I would do once you get your sticking down do everything left hand lead if you're right handed do everything left hand lead um, and then also do alternating stickings. Do, play with the stickings because that's where you're going to find your inconsistencies, especially if you're working on your phrasing. Uh, it gets much more difficult if you're trying to play the same type of phrasing and the same, you know, same lilt to a certain rhythmic grouping if you're playing doubles or if you're going off the left hand, if you have a mixed type of sticking. You want to be able to get to a point where all of those feel very comfortable and you stop thinking about the sticking as much. For the tempo in his book, in A23, for Mitchell Peter Intermediate, he has a tempo from 66 to 80. And I would, I would play within that time frame, and I would, or uh, tempo, and I'd even go further, you know, if you want to work on something, you know, maybe let's say, let's take it at 100. You know, you could play,
so when you mess with the temp tempos and, and you're playing the same etude, it, it turns into a different etude. Uh, so, so there's a lot of different things you can do with just the way you practice these things, where you can get a lot of use out of it. So this is, uh, this is now the rudimental etude Wilcoxon, uh, solo number one from the All-American uh, snare drum book. Let's talk about some some phrasing things there. Notice I'm I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to do more than just the two height uh, dynamic difference between the accented notes and the unaccented notes. I'm trying to do more. I'm trying to, you know, go to certain arrival points and come away from certain things and maybe instilling even small, you know, pushes in dynamics for certain things to convey much better where where these phrases are instead of just playing a two height system where it's that's actually what I'm trying to get away from it's not how you string together notes with that type of playing with that kind of drum line approach even though this is rudimental you don't you don't want to approach it like that uh, as, as a drum line thing and there's actually you know if you look at the title of the book. Uh, oh, actually, you know what? I'm thinking of a different book. It doesn't say it here. It says it in the preface, though. Based entirely on the old tradition of famous masters, a touch of swing was added to give each a certain lift drummers of today prefer. And that's how you want to play this. You don't want to play this rigid so it's not shut, dot, 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 shut, dot, but dot, 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 but dot, but dot, but dot, so and notice how I'm even putting a little bit of a little bit of a crescendo at the end of that. Um, into the into the next phrase there again sticking if you want to work on the uh, dif difference in sticking uh, do all of this off the left so like going back to the Mitchell Peters a two number three right there's a bunch of different I played this earlier there's a bunch of different dynamic changes in this I would actually play all of this at a forte or fortissimo dynamic range I'd play the whole thing and I'd practice it that way on the pad. And then I'd go the other extreme. I'd play everything piano and pianissimo uh, as, as a way of really working on each individual dynamic level. That's kind of what you should strive for with all of this, is figuring out how to change something or, or change your perception of how to approach some of these etudes, even though you might think these are very easy. I mean, this this book alone, I mean, is is very useful and, and I come back to it all the time because there's so many different ways you can approach this and practice it and what's great about it is it's it's simplistic in a way so you can really take that and do a lot more with it. Let's move to the advanced snare drum studies. Mitchell Peters book. This is the first etude from this book and I'll play this down and then I'll talk about some of the things that we've already discussed but how to incorporate that within here and how to practice some of this stuff. Again, for, for this etude, I would practice this all the same dynamic level and then I would go back and, and practice it at the other extreme. So all fortissimo and then all pianissimo.
see. Do you think approaching the phrasing on these etudes is about moving towards the agogic accents, or are there cadences? Okay. Um, yeah, I think one way to start to think about that is, is good, agogic accents. Um, I would think a lot about uh, the form of a piece. Some of the etudes, like some of the Delacluse etudes, uh, purposely get away from that and there's phrasing over the bar line. Uh, and, and that's the case too in some of the Pratt stuff when you have paradiddles or, or different rudiments that are over the bar line. You would phrase those individually over the bar lines rather than trying to, in every instance, uh, phrase it agogically. Yeah, I would, I, yes and no. So it, it just depends on which A2 you're playing and what the musical context is. For something like this, um, I, I would say yes, definitely. I mean, most of this is, is played um, with the gotchic accents in terms of, in terms of the meter. Um, you know, there are certain things though. For instance, I'll play, but on the first page of this A2, um, two lines from the bottom uh, you have this pianissimo uh, sixteenth notes. Right? That's one long phrase within that whole thing. And I wouldn't say it, it definitely like has a strong beat on the on, on each of the downbeats of that measure. Actually it doesn't. It has a tie and you play off of the the E um, of of each one, so that first one, you have the pickup, three pickups into the, and I would lead all the way up. That whole time, I'd be thinking of, I'd have that kind of terraced feel, and there'd be a lilt within that. And a, a kind of phrase in a groove within that. And then you land on the downbeat of the next page, which is fortissimo printed. And with a lot of this page, the way he has this is I, I would I would be careful. You don't have any accents on these flams, so you don't want to play. That's one thing I tell my students to get away from. Uh, when you don't have accents on those flams, you shouldn't play them as accents. Are they going to be accentuated? Yes, because they're two notes instead of one. But notice how with that and the way it's accentuated, it's more in terms of the length um, and articulation difference rather than it's louder because there's an accent and a dynamic difference. those when you get all of these quick ornaments you don't want to take away from the rhythm everything should you should be able to groove all of that and you just you fill in the ornaments as you go here and there you don't you don't want to get you know too bogged down you don't want to start to get no you want to hear you want to hear the opposite And that's the end of that phrase right there. If you can't, you know, dictate down what I'm playing, you should be able to hear the meter. It should be clear that I'm in 3-4 for this whole thing. And it should be clear when I'm purposely going over the bar lines and playing phrases that don't line up with the downbeats. When you're talking about phrasing and you're talking about music, it comes down to two things. It comes down to anticipation and resolution. And so with rhythm, the anticipation comes when you're not playing the downbeat, right? When you're playing the off beats, the ands. Then when you get back to the downbeat and you get, you know, uh, you know, you start to play things in three, four that are more agogic and, and everything lines up with those big beats, 
that's when you have the resolution. And so you want to phrase accordingly and you want to have, you want to give some of those phrasings within that some lilt before you get back to the, to the rigidness of some of these. Uh, and notice with all of these things, like uh, for instance, this measure. Uh, that that's how one of these one of one of these measures is written. Dum dum And notice how I'm even just singing that. I'm not singing ba 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 You're playing in such a way where it's not. Completely not musical. It, it doesn't matter how even the hands are uh, between. That's not musical. You actually want a little bit less of that. You want to be able to. Uh, you, the hands are even, but you have enough dexterity to manipulate, you know, coming down off a certain figure or, or rising up to it. Even that. The, it's the way you prep and it's the articulation of the first one and how you throw physically and then how you end that rhythm in terms of articulation. Prep. So for this, this is a longer etude. So I, I won't play the whole thing. What I'll do is, well, I'll play the whole thing, but I'll, I'll do um, each, um, let's see, each repeat sign, I'll, I'll just do it one, once. did for the first phrase I did take the, the repeat twice but anyways there's that um, with with all of these etudes what what I strive for myself and with my students is to get to a point where you can play an etude a week whether and that's for both a concert style and a rudimental style for just snare drum and then think about all the other percussion instruments we have you want to be doing a two mallet etude a week a, a four mallet one a week a timpani etude each week. That's what I strive for with my students, it's what I strive for with myself, because you're only going to advance as much as the amount of music that you're working on. You know, that has nothing to do with what instrument you play. That's not something that's specifically uh, uh, just for percussion. That goes for any instrumentalist. That's that's the best way of approaching these things. Having, you know, do, do your warm-ups and your exercises every day, but then also have you know, musical goals in terms of, you know, what actual pieces are you playing each day and then each week. And then on top of that, yeah, you can have a bigger piece you're working on or a concerto or anything like that on top of that. But if, if you're only working on a concerto or, or some big piece that's going to take you months and that's all you do every day, that, that's a poor way to structure your practice session. And so just making that uh, adjustment, I think, in the way you approach um, your music and, and the musical pieces that you prepare each each day and each week, it's going to have a big difference in how much you advance. Okay, well, 
we're gonna wrap this up then. Uh, next week, uh, next Friday is going to be. Thanks for this class. You're welcome. Next Friday is going to be the last uh, live stream I probably do, and we're going to work on we're going to work on technique uh, for next next Friday's class. And we're actually going to change the time I think because we've been having trouble getting enough students on at a time I think that works for everyone. So we might be doing 3 p.m. next week. So stay tuned for that. Thanks a lot. What you said really resonated with me. Oh, great. The whole point is this: this is trying to supplement the lack of you know, uh, hands-on music education that's absent right now because of COVID-19. We want to be able to, you know, give students the opportunity to, you know, take some of these master classes and clinics with HSO musicians. So next week, we're going to be talking strictly technique. We're going to be working out of stick control. And then the parent book, Accents and Rebounds. And then we'll probably be doing a little bit of developing dexterity. Okay, so we're going to be working out of these books and we're going to just be talking about kind of the mechanics of drumming as a whole and what are some of the technical things you can work on um, in tandem with these musical etudes. You have to do the music etudes. You have to, have to, have to do it. You can't just do your eight on a hand and, and work out of stick control. It's not enough. It, do it doesn't teach you how to play musically and how to group individual notes together uh, and, and string them into a musical phrase. I will show you how the mechanics of that work works in terms of playing more musical um, rather than having every note you play staccato and, and, and it doesn't equate to anything really musically outside of pure rhythm. Alright, thanks for tuning in guys.